Good evening, everyone. It is October 17, 2012. I'm Rene Ritchie, and tonight we are talking about Apple's October 23rd special event. We're talking about the iPad mini. We are scratching Microsoft's surface, and we're wondering if Apple can still sell trucks. This is the iMore Show. Joining me tonight is the editor-in-chief of The Loop, loopinsight.com, Jim Dalrymple. When you look at Apple as a whole and you look at the iPad mini and how it fits into the strategy, does that look more like a consumer device as opposed to the more expensive uh, larger iPad? Like maybe the larger iPad is more of a laptop, not, like you use it on your lap, you use it while sitting up, you use it to do more kind of productive work and the iPad mini might be something that you use while you're you know, reading in bed or you take around with you more mobile. Mm -hmm. You, you know what's interesting about that is that I, I think it really depends on the person. I mean, you're going to get some executives that are going to love uh, a 7.85 inch, we'll just call it a 7 inch iPad. Uh, they're going to love that because they're on the go all the time and they can operate, you know, do more with one hand, but they still have a bigger screen. So they're going to love that. Um, then, you know, you get the people that, that, We'll, we'll travel on a, a train or something to work and they'll enjoy the bigger one. I really think it depends on the person. It's not going to be a single segment of the population that's going to really go for, you know, a seven inch or the 10 inch. Uh, I've talked to a lot of people that they really like uh, the thought of they take the subway to work. The 10 inch iPad is too big for them. You know, they, they, it, it's just confined space and it's too big. So that in that case, a seven inch is going to be perfect for them. And they're really looking forward to it. Now, I must say that I, I haven't been convinced about a seven inch iPad. Not, not that they weren't going to do one, but that I don't like the seven inch form factor on, on the, the tablets that I've seen so far. Yeah. That's a, you know, a, a Blackberry playbook and, you know, some of the other ones i just kindles and nexuses yeah i just haven't liked them so you know i i'm i'm thinking that when there is a a bigger or smaller <laughs> iPad, i'm gonna say you know a, a bigger and better but a smaller ipad that you know part of the experience that apple gives you is not just with the hardware it's also with the software you know, so it's the whole experience. And, you know, somebody uh, said in the chat room there that that 0.85 makes a difference. It absolutely does. That 0.85 is going to make a huge difference because it's going to allow apps to work differently than, you know, what a what a seven inch would. It, it's going to be very interesting for me to see because I, I haven't been, you know, totally in favor of uh, or see the point of a, a seven inch. Yeah, it's also going to be running the iPad version of iOS as far as, as far as I've heard, maybe as far as the rumors have been saying, and not the iPhone version where a lot of other tablets have been running the smartphone version, as Steve Jobs you know, said, blown up to seven inches. Yeah. And I think that makes a huge difference too. Well, I, yeah. I mean, if you, can, if you can make everything look and work properly, mm -hmm. then, you know, it's, it's going to be a, a good thing for you. John Gruber famously has been calling this the um, iPad Air, and he likens the difference between the old iPad, I don't know what to call it, the big iPad is like the MacBook, and the smaller iPad will be like the MacBook Air. And I've seen you at WWDC and Macworld Gym using um, the 11-inch MacBook Air. So I think that's right, because some people just think it's a cheaper iPad, but the lighter, thinner part, for some people, it was just the size and weight that was the, the barrier of entry to the iPad market. Well, yeah, I mean, that's that's the whole thing. This, depending on what you do is going to uh, dictate what product you get. And, you know, an iPad Air, when I go uh, you know, to a show or when I go traveling, and uh, if they have something like that, that's going to be perfect. Yeah. You know, because it's, it's going to be big enough that you'll be able to, to get your stuff done but small enough that you'll be able to easily carry it around. We can put it in so, our winter jackets on the dog sled, Jim. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. 
Yeah, no, I think I think that will be a will be a huge difference. The rumors are also saying that you know it's going to be super thin, not just light. Almost last generation iPod Touch seven point two millimeters thin, and it it seems at the surface that Apple's almost obsessed with thinness. But when you pick up a device and you feel it, and I think you said this in your iPhone five review, um, the thinness. I, you know, I saw that iPhone commercial when they said it's bigger and smaller. There's more of it and less of it, yeah. and it kind of it kind of seemed goofy to me. But then when you use it, it really is that feeling. You feel like what you have is physically bigger than what you're holding. Well, and, and that's the thing. When I first picked up the iPhone five, and um, I got mine at the uh, the event, and when I picked it up, you're looking at something. I went back to the to the hotel, and you're looking at something that's. That's physically bigger than the iPhone 4S. But when you pick it up, you expect it to be heavy. Yep. And it's and it's actually lighter. And and that kind of messes with your mind a little because your your mind is telling you this is bigger, so it's gonna be heavier. But it's not. Yeah. And, and so, you know, it's kind of a weird feeling the first time you pick one up and you realize how much lighter it is. And then Apple uh, tells you it's smaller by volume and your mind just explodes. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, there's all kinds of weirdness going on there. But the same thing happens when you pick up the the iPod Touch. Yeah. You know, because it, it, it looks to be the same size, so you expect about the same weight. And you pick it up, and it's like nothing. It's like air. Yeah. And it makes a difference. People, it, it again, people think that Apple fetishizes the thinness, but the thinness goes into the lightness. None of the, you can't just pull apart one quality and say Apple doesn't need this because they're very good at making the parts better than the sum of the whole. Yeah. And, you know, it's not so much about thinness with Apple, but about the user experience. I mean, if you look at the, the original um, uh, iPhone, I mean, now by today's standards, that was huge. Yeah. You know, and, and it's, it's a, a difficult, uh, a difficult thing to, to really get your mind around, but it's true. <laughs> Somebody said, let's talk about the FBI warning. <laughs> <laughs> we can, yeah, we can get to that. That's fine. Um, that'll, that'll Actually, that'll be fun. But uh, just to finish through the iPad mini stuff, I get the feeling this is going to be the same thing, that we'll pick it up and we'll be shocked again at the lightness of it and the way it feels in the hand. And the screen will, because the bezel's, Again, rumored to be smaller, the screen is going to perceptively seem bigger, and it'll be the same sort of—I don't want to say illusion because that kind of that kind of doesn't give credit to the engineering that they're doing. But they really are nailing making the simple thing very impressive. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's what they do. You know, they they do make it impressive, but it's also—I mean—they have so much invested in the back end of all of these devices now. Um, uh, you know, with, with iCloud and, and all of the stuff that you can do that they're, you know, they, they focus on the OS, they focus on the software that you can buy for it and, you know, allowing third parties to yeah. put software in there as well. So there's a lot for us to be able to do. There was a rumor last week that Apple would not um, include uh, cellular on this to keep costs down, which made no sense to me. I, I heard nothing about that. And Apple has always had a Wi-Fi model. and They're just happy to charge you 130 bucks extra if you want cellular. And I, I've had a Nexus 7. It doesn't have cellular. And that's a deal breaker for me because I want to use it when I'm in places without Wi-Fi. Yeah, I, I can't I can't see that. I can't see that because I, I agree with you. You know, for, for me, having having an iPad mini and being portable yeah. is all, being portable anywhere, not being portable um, wherever there's uh, Wi-Fi service. And like you said, if you only want a Wi-Fi one, that's fine. You yeah. should be able to get one. Uh, but if you want the, the cellular service and have that data connection wherever you are, I think that you should have that too. There was a, a similar, I'm not going to read anything into you putting the image tag of iPad event in your, in your invitation, Jim. I'm just going to let people mouse over that, you know, on their own and enjoy the Easter egg. But uh, there have been rumors, and I've also heard rumors, <laughs> <laughs> that Apple might take the opportunity to go thunder, to go lightning across the board. And, you know, there was, there's an iPad 3, that's going to be the only modern device with a dock connector. If Apple, I'm not going to ask you if you think they will or not, but if Apple does go uh, lightning with the iPad 3, just a minor re uh, rev, and also include international LTE as a gift to the Australians and the Europeans, um, 
I don't see that being a big deal. I, I, some people are upset. Apple's making a new iPad. It's just going to be a lightning connector, and now you can buy it in Europe and Australia. Yeah, I mean, there's there's so many rumors out there. If Apple is going lightning, then they're going to go lightning. You know, they're they're going to do well. I remember be, before the the iPad three when it launched, yeah. it had all the problems with uh, LTE. Yeah. And they've got much better uh, chips now. They've got much better chips now. I mean, you know, they 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 have to they have to really sink this one. I think. Yeah. I mean, look, let's face, look at it this way: Apple, Apple really invented the modern um, tablet market. They didn't invent yes. the tablet market. Microsoft has been, you know, rummaging around in trash bins for <laughs> in the tablet market. They had handles, Jim. They had handles on tablet PC. I mean, just crazy stuff um, for a decade, you know, so this is, Apple didn't come up and say, oh, we're going to invent this new thing called the tablet. Microsoft have been doing it for a long time, but Microsoft kept screwing it up and all their partners kept screwing it up. Apple invented the, what we now know as a tablet. So the modern version of that. And. They're really, for the first time in a while, they're entering a market that's already successful in the the seven inch mini type market, already successful by a, a few other makers. Successful ish. I mean, Amazon until well, they support Canada, I'm not going to give them any credit. Yeah, yeah, okay, <laughs> successful ish. So now they're going to swing back around and and enter a market with with other competitors already in it. And try and take that. Now, the yeah. big question is, can they go into that market and take it? And and they really, they have one quarter to do it. Yeah. Because the analysts will be all over them if they don't do it. And it will be seen as a failure if they don't do it. So can they do it? I think they can. I think if we let our imaginations wander and we picture an iPad mini that starts at a very low, very attractive price... Uh, with given that Apple can sell it in 90 plus countries and no one else comes close to offering, you know, that kind of breadth of distribution, they have iTunes stores in countries that no other competitor can match. Uh, Mac Stories had a great article up showing the map of where different yeah. people can sell. And Apple is uh, Apple is the only global company. Everything else is like you, you go down. It's like Apple 160. The rest eight, seven. Yeah. Five. I mean, it's it's crazy when you start looking at that map. I, I just had fun pressing on the buttons myself. But. <laughs> yeah, but it, I mean, it really shows you. And again, rumors at, that Apple will do it. Apple, um, Serenity Caldwell from Macworld had an excellent talk at Singleton when she said that Amazon had a huge lead in books. And they kind of screwed it up because they were content to do almost photocopies of black and white books on the Kindle. And then Apple came in with iBooks and they were color and then they were HTML5 and interactive. And it really was a leap forward in books that Amazon is only now starting to starting to catch up with. If you imagine an iPad mini sold in a, an amount of countries that dwarfs Amazon's reach and Apple getting really serious about iBooks, Jim, I think that they have a really good competitive chance. Well, and I, I really think that when when Apple sets its mind to doing something, they 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 kind of have this uh, built in base now, where they just they announce it and then boom, it it's out into all of these different channels. Yeah. And you know, it's kind of like when when you or I, I guess, uh, tweet a, a new story. There's that like blast of people that will go read it. The network effect. Yeah, right away. And then you, you know, throughout the day, it, it's still constant, but it's not like that initial blast. And yeah. that's what Apple has, because if they have enough, if they can build enough to get it out to all of those countries, even their, their normal launch countries, which are what the US, Canada, yeah. Germany, UK, um, a few others. Yeah, Australia, usually. Australia. Yeah. Uh, you know, so th they have this this core launch system that they they have set up, and it works. It works for them. It's getting better and better. I mean, I, the iPhone four, they don't, they didn't even do Canada. The four, we had to wait an extra month. But then, since the four S and now the five and the iPad three, they can really project product now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's just uh, it, it's it's silly how much they can sell when you can consider this now. 
Um, I, I don't know which quarter this was. It was probably sometime last year. In the quarter, um, RIM shipped, not sold, but shipped, about 200,000 playbooks. Yeah. Apple sold 102,000 iPads a day. Yes. A day. And that's not shipped. That's sold to customers. That's sold. Yeah. So Apple outdid RIM in two days. Yeah. I mean, if you're RIM, that's that's got to make you just want to jump out the window. Except that there's a snowbank there. And you didn't <laughs> so, well, I, I don't know. I, But there's other competitors out there now, too. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's absolutely true. I mean, we've we've I think we talked about it before, but again, I I'm not sure how we judge competition now because they get a lot of attention and they have a lot of effect in the U.S. market. But if you remember, the Zoom never went anywhere internationally. The Kindle is in like two, three countries. Uh, Apple is selling more in China than most people are selling globally, and no one is coming near to that international market. But but now my, Microsoft has the Surface. Yes. So. I mean, it looks to me like it's going to suck as bad as the Zoom, but maybe I'm wrong. Okay, so you, John Gruber liked the commercial. He thought it was fun and kind of showed off the message they were aiming for. You, yep. you said, and I'm going to quote you here, that it sucks balls. <laughs> I, thought that it, I thought it was actually interesting. I thought that they tried to show what was different than the iPad. It has a clickety-clackety keyboard. It has a kickstand, and guys in business suits will dance for it. Well, see, I got the part about, see, I got, you buy a Surface and the cast from Glee will sing with you. <laughs> you know, I mean, I really think that Microsoft missed an opportunity with the, their first ad to do something cool uh, with the unveiling. If you're going to unveil it and not really show that it does anything, then unveil it and do, you know, a secret little, um, you know, black blackness black background and just a little light shining on it so that you can't really see do something cool yeah but what they did was people dancing i mean come on that that, that wasn't very good and i know that <clears throat> john said that it, it was a branding thing but i i just don't agree i don't think that it showed anything to do with with the brand and to me sean blanc summed it up perfectly today he said that if if he didn't know better, he would say that Microsoft's next big thing is a keyboard. A keyboard attachment for an iPad, maybe. You know, yeah. and that's what it's like because yeah. all they showed is is this quickety quackety thing. Yeah. I, so I, I don't get it. I, I really believe that Microsoft had an opportunity, and I think that they wasted it. Yeah. And I this this isn't the point where you start branding um the company, everybody knows Microsoft. They needed to to show people the the surface and why it was good. They needed to and, make me reach for my credit card. Right. And and I don't think that they did that because re I was reaching for the remote to change the channel. Um yeah. you, you, I, I just I don't understand. I really don't understand. I got a vibe from it is that, you know, when Apple released the iPad, you can argue about whether they had absolutely, they absolutely knew who their customer was aside from Steve Jobs. But with the iPad too, they were super confident. You know, this, they had the voice, technology alone is not enough. And then they showed you time after time what real people could do with it. The Surface to me, it, I, I couldn't tell, is it for business? Is it for fun? It's hard to be both. You're, like a, a story that tries to have two parts at the same time is very confusing. Yeah. And it was like RIM. When RIM announced, you know, RIM is an enterprise company, so they call it the playbook. And then it's supposed to be like, you know, amateur hour is over, but they're showing a lot of flashy fun stuff. It was a really confusing message. And to me, this commercial was like that. You know, this thing is going to have full-on Microsoft Office, but the guys in suits were dancing. It, well, and, and the schoolgirls were so angry. Yes. Why were they so angry? The keyboards you're, wouldn't clack. You're little kids. Don't be so angry, little <laughs> kids. Have a Heineken. <laughs> you know, I, 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 look, when, when an iPad ad starts up and you hear Peter Coyote's voice yes. saying, you can, uh, you know, take pictures and you can yeah. create music and you can read a book and I, you start to see how this thing can can fit into your lifestyle it opens and worlds for you 
It does. And and you feel because it's Peter's voice and Peter is such a great voice, yeah. um, you start to feel comfortable and relaxed looking at it. And no matter what happens on the screen, you're listening to Peter's voice. You're look you are looking at the screen and you're saying, hey, I read books. I could do that on that. Or I like music. I can, you know, play guitar and I'd like to do that. So there's so many things. It makes you say, I want that. Do. Yeah. And and that's what they do with those commercials. So uh, now I will say somebody uh, said to me on Twitter yesterday, how is the Microsoft commercial any different than the iPod bounce commercial? Yeah, because Apple didn't say what it did. It, it's just iPods bouncing around on the thing. And to me, do you have an opinion on that? I, those that's a fifth and a seventh generation product that is right. incredibly well established and branded that everyone knows that it is and all your message has to be is we have a new one go buy it yeah that's that's it that's exactly it I, the 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 iPod is 10 years old yeah it's still incredibly popular and people know what an iPod is it, it's like not knowing what a car is yes people know what an iPod is so all you're trying to do at this point in its life cycle is show that it's fun yeah. And the Bounce commercial was fun. The The iPad itself is still relatively new. People know what an iPad is. They know what, what a tablet is. But I think that a lot of people are still trying to come to terms with how they're going to use it and how they're going to fit it into their Why lives. they need it. And that's why specs don't matter. Mm -hmm. That's why when you look at, at a product like this, it's not about the specs. It's about what am I going to do with it? I know how I use mine and that the, how I use mine is probably completely different than how you use yours. But you probably saw a glimpse of someone making music in one of those commercials that you could identify with and become interested in. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, I look at different apps when I see um, music apps, I, I look at those and say, is this something that I could use or no? Because I have a particular way of, of using the iPad, if, even for music. And, Excuse me. I'm not going to change the way that I do things to fit the iPad in. Mm -hmm. But if the iPad can start to to work its way in because of the, you know apps or or the peripherals that I can plug my guitar into, then I'm on all, all over it. I'm all over that. This, and I ju I just don't see that Microsoft did that with the Surface. You have to, and the pricing came out as well, and it, that's interesting to talk about too, because there's a huge difference between cost and value. You can tell someone how much something costs, but you have to prove to them that that's valuable to them. Otherwise, you know, two hundred dollars can be expensive, and a thousand dollars can be cheap. Yeah. Uh, and the Surface pricing came out, and I will grant you that iPad pricing, if you break it down, it it can look big. Like there's diff three different sizes, two different colors. There's three G and non three G, but it's still it ends up being a very manageable grid. You know, you want you your options are very limited. With the Surface starting at five hundred dollars, comes with a black keyboard. If I want a white keyboard, it's a different price. There's two kinds of keyboards. I saw uh, Tom Warren from The Verge saying that if you want to use it in business, there's a separate license, uh, and it, it started to make my brain bleed very, very slowly. And that shouldn't be what a consumer product does. That's and and. Not to mention, it, it was somebody at The Verge, and I, I linked to it, a, a, it was a long time ago at this point, but they were using uh, Microsoft Office on, uh, in, in touch mode. They could not get it to work. And, and this, wasn't, this was a, a demo. Yeah. Uh, he looked like he was at a store or something, but I think the guy's name was Rich at The Verge. I don't know. Uh, anyway, he was trying to get this thing to work, and it just would not work in touch mode. And of course it doesn't work because it's a desktop app that Microsoft is trying to shoehorn into a tablet. Yes. That is never going to work. If it, What Microsoft should have done is make tablet apps like Apple did for uh, iWork. Yeah. iWork uh, apps are powerful. And just because when you open them up, there's not a whole lot going on on the screen, that means that you have room to type. But if I want to format text, if I want to do all kinds of crazy things, they're all in the menus. The menus are all there. So you it's can like finger painting with productivity. Yeah, you can do all kinds of crazy things in there, yep. but it's all hidden. Yep. It's powerful, but it's hidden. And Microsoft doesn't seem to get the fact that you can have power, but it's got to be 
it's got to be back there. You know, you don't just need, you know, some some stupid stuff to to put on there with. Oh, they have the ribbon. It looks like they took the Windows Phone stuff, and instead of making it work like Windows Phone, they thought white space and flat, you know, flat colors, and that will make it look similar. But we won't change the way it works at all. Well, I don't, I don't know. I, I just. And I don't want to, like, I'm, I'm sure you're the same, Jim. I don't want to bash Microsoft. I think Apple is best when they have really good, really serious competition. And I think Apple is like that. I think when Tim Cook comes on stage and he points out how few Android tablet apps there are and how unsuccessful competing tablets, uh, you know, you can think that he's being cocky or, or, or rubbing it in. But I think part of him is a little disappointed saying, we showed you how to sell hundreds of millions of these things. We said technology doesn't matter. You said, tell your wife it has a Tegra 2 processor. What do you want from us? Yeah, I mean it's it, it is kind of sad. Now we we if if you look at the ads that that Microsoft did that were terrible, I think uh, you know other people may like them, but I haven't talked to too many people that that do like them. Obviously, John likes them, but look at the ad from uh, Amazon. Yeah, the one that they did a little while ago where. Uh, it, the ad starts out with Amazon opening up the mailbox and they say, we're the company with the smile on the box. Yeah. I, yeah, that was a great ad. You know, they, it seemed to me that they were, you know, kind of taking a page out of Apple's book there, whatever. It was a great ad. It, it, they showed the uh, Kindle and people were reading books on it and it was great. And, you know, you, you the message from that was you, you buy a Kindle and you're going to be comfortable and things are going to be it's wonderful. It's part of the yeah. Amazon ecosystem and the smile. Yeah. I mean, you know, not that the cast from Glee is going to dance around you and you're going to have a bunch of angry schoolgirls pointing fingers at you, you know? I, so... Well, the thing I take issue with is, the, is Microsoft from the very beginning with Windows 8 and the Slate was all about no compromises. But to me, whenever you say no compromise, it just means you're shoving the compromise onto the user. So yeah. when I go to an Apple store, I do not have to choose between iPad, I iPad iOS or iPad Mac OS 10. I don't have to choose between, you know, this the, the one... And when I use it, sorry, I don't have to use it in iOS mode and OS 10 mode. I don't have Safari iOS and Safari. It's a very simple, stress-free, easy to use. I can hit the home button if I'm confused, return to a known state. It's, it's liberating. That kind of restriction is liberating. On the other hand, everything else just feels like a lot of noise. I, I don't disagree with you. I, it's, I don't know. It's tough to see. I, I understand that, that people and companies want to, to be different and they want to show how they can be different from Apple. But the problem is that, is that they, they kind of make the same product, yeah. you know, so they're, they're trying to tell people that they're different, but they're not. And, you know, for Microsoft to, to take its desktop apps and try and put them in to uh, a tablet and a tablet experience is really putting a huge burden on the users. Yeah. And I, I don't think it's a fair burden. I, I think it's very unfair for them to do that. Uh, you know, I, I mean, we yelled at Apple because we wanted iWork on the on the iPad and yes. we wanted iLife and we wanted GarageBand and all that. I, to be honest, I didn't think that they would be able to do GarageBand as soon as they did. But, you know, kudos to them. They did. Um, but... When when we yell at them, we think, you know, come on, give this to us. We want it. And then remember, we were all downloading the Google Apps type or the, the open yep. office type things at first. Oof, boy. Um, but, but we yell we, because we care, right? Like if we didn't care about a company, we wouldn't even talk about them. But we care about Google and Microsoft and these companies. and We want them to do better and we want them to give us, you know, great products. Well, and, and that's exactly it. And when when we did get it and and we see all the work somebody posted a little while ago i think it might have been jade that said uh you know some of the best thing the simple things are the best things in life or something yeah. like that and it's so true but it takes a lot of work to take something that powerful and make it simple did you see the iPhoto session at WWDC where they explained how they made the app because they didn't just port iPhoto from the mac they, they had a lot of time spent thinking about how someone would use it on a touch screen. And that, to me, exemplifies how they did iWork and iLife. It was the opposite of the approach Microsoft's taken. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, there has to be, 
some some simple things that you're willing to do. And, you know, they, they take those, like, for instance, open up um, uh, pages on the, on the iPad, and it looks like there's nothing there. But start typing and then select some text and, you know, hit the, the question mark and hit, you know, tap some of the little buttons. And all of a sudden, the stuff all comes out for you. Yeah. But since you don't need it to just type, they hide it away. Yes. That's, that's the brilliance. The complexity it's, is hidden below the surface. It's kind of like me. The complexity <laughs> is hidden below the surface. Yeah, but no, but I think that's you know that's a, a point you can't you can't state enough is that they go through this process and Apple could be behaving exactly the same way. They could have made just you know move the app over, but it's it's interesting to see the way Apple tackles these problems. And the thing that you know when you work in design, the first thing you learn is design is compromise. No matter how, even if you're Apple, you have a hundred billion dollars in the bank, some of the smartest engineers in the world. You cannot do two things at the same time. You have to choose. And just the idea that you would sell something, it gives me that Google feeling. You know when Google says something that you that you know isn't true and you know that they know that you know isn't true. So they kind of you get the feeling they think you're an idiot. So when they don't. when they say no compromises, I think they think I'm an idiot because I know everything is a compromise. Yeah, it's just a matter of what level in that compromise the company is willing to go to to fix or to at least make the compromise hidden enough for us yeah and what level of the compromise is on the user and a lot of times that's what makes our decision when that level of compromise gets too much for us as a user we will stop using applications and a lot of times maybe we don't even know that's why we stop you know yeah i mean maybe maybe uh you know we're using an app and it's just something about the app that we don't excuse me we don't like they made bad choices in the design. And they made bad choices. Yeah. And that compromise comes down and affects the way that we work. And it may be just that, you know, you have to tap two different screens to get something done. And in your mind, you know that this is not good. You know it doesn't make sense. But as soon as somebody comes out with a, another app that does things a bit differently and it makes sense to you, you will you'll go to that. Well, look at the, I mean, uh, I, don't, I think you had a BlackBerry before the iPhone. Was that right, Jim? Yeah, I had a Trio 680. When the original iPhone came out, it couldn't do anywhere near what those phones could do. But the user experience was so good, we really didn't care. I mean, they gave us something that was better, and we knew that one day it'd be much better. Yep. There was this great talk at Singleton from um, Michael Lopp from Rands and Repose about the table with three chairs, where you have the designer, the developer, and the dictator. And, you know, they both have their jobs. One has to build something. One has to make it interface with humans. And the other one has to be the arbiter of taste and has to absolutely make the decisions. Uh, and he pointed, of course, to Steve Jobs as an example. Uh, but he also pointed to Microsoft now where Steve Ballmer hasn't acted as a dictator. He hasn't been the arbiter. He's not a product guy. He doesn't come off as a product guy. He doesn't come off as a guy deciding. So it's almost happenstantial. You either get an Xbox or a Zune, and there doesn't seem to be a strategy to ensure that you get more Xboxes than Zunes. Well, and I love the Xbox. I think the Xbox is the, the best uh, gaming platform out there. I really do. I've had one. I had an original Xbox, and then I got the Xbox uh, Live, and now my son plays it, and he's 17 now, so my son, you know, just kicks my ass. <laughs> uh, and it's And it's really sad because... You know, when when your 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 kid is young, you you play these games with them, and oh, you yeah. let them win. Oh God, you won again! Yeah. How did you beat me? Then he gets and cocky, I, so you destroy him once, just to remind him your yeah, dad. Just, <laughs> just hey, hey, I'm bigger than you, boy. Yeah. And and now now my son is 17. He's like six <laughs> four. He, he has a full beard, and so I'm looking up at him, and I go play a game with him, like a hockey game or something, and you know, he beats me like 18, nothing, you know, and, and we race and he, he stops on the side of the road and waits for me. <laughs> so now I don't even play anymore. I don't <laughs> want to play with you. He took your last Microsoft product away from you. <laughs> so he's, he's, uh, he's a gamer. He loves to game. So, and he loves the Xbox yeah. too. So Microsoft does make some, some good products and and the xbox is is a perfect example of that they poured a ton of money in there yeah so i think if they 
they do. I'm surprised that Balmer is still there, to be honest. Absolutely. But they need to do that with other products. The it, It's almost sad to say, but it's almost like the tablet took Microsoft off guard. Yeah, unbelievably because so. For them to come out with the Surface now is is really a sad state when you look at what they have. Because not only have they been in the tablet market for a decade, um, you know, the, the uh, iPad has been around for a few years. Mm -hmm. And now Microsoft comes out with a product that almost looks like it's a couple of years behind. Like the Zoom with the iPod, same history repeating yeah. itself. So how can you how can you be in an industry where you know your competition is is already way ahead of you and then you come up with a product that's 2 years behind do you remember you know, when steve jobs and bill gates were on stage together at all things d and steve jobs did that famous alan k quote about people who want to write great software want to make their own hardware and bill gates said you know i i respectfully disagree there's some areas where that seems to be changing more and more every does, year yeah i mean so much so that balmer just said that you know, there may be instances where they want to uh, make uh, their hardware themselves. You well, put that, out a letter, that, yeah. That doesn't guarantee that the hardware is going to be good, and we've yeah. seen that with the Surface, and we've seen it with the Zoom. Yes, I mean this is this is nothing new from Microsoft, and this is what gets frustrating, and I, why I don't understand why Balmer's still there because they keep. Uh, uh, regurgitating the same things, the same strategy all the time. Oh, we're going to kill Apple and this is going to be great and stick with us. They don't do anything. What what somebody has to do is to come out with, I would like to see somebody say, come out on stage and say, you know what? We believe that Apple is doing the tablet wrong. And we yes. have a better way of doing it. We've been working on this for the last several years. And in three months on this day, we're going to come out with this incredible new tablet and prove that Apple is wrong. I would love that. That would be great. That's what somebody needs to do. That's what Steve Jobs did in 2010. That's what Steve Jobs did. He did it with the iPhone. He did yep. it with the iPod. He did it with um, uh, the uh, the iPad. Yeah. And to a certain degree, he really changed uh, portables as well, portable computers as well, but not to the same extent that he changed these other things. So I would love to be able to see somebody come out and do that. Steve Ballmer is not the man to do that. He's he's not. So I guess to be fair, uh, let's pivot back to Apple for a second. If you go by this dictator, this auteur principle, it seems to me that Tim Cook is a different kind of leader where maybe Steve Jobs would have a gut reaction and make a decision early on. Tim Cook seems to be more really the operations, the logistics guy. He does the math. He runs the numbers. And he might even take a little... He might even take more consensus, take a little bit more time to get there. They're doing f fantastically well, so it's obviously working. But it seems like there's a different flavor in the way that he makes decisions. Well, I, I think that when it comes right down to it, Tim recognizes that he has to be that guy that is just going to stop and say, that's it. This is the way we're going. Yeah. You know, that, that has to be him. And he has been around Steve for a long time and watching Steve do that. So, you know, you have the designer, you have the coder, you have the dictator, you know, and th those people are all there. Um, it's just a different way of things because, you know, there's not going to be anybody like Steve. So things are going to run a little bit differently, but it, it hasn't seemed to hurt them. No, it seems like it just Steve was more passionate and Tim is more rational. I mean, that's a gross overgeneralization, but it just seems like Tim is really... I don't know if Steve Jobs cared about the numbers, the logistics, when things left factories, when they arrived there, as much as Tim does. Well, yeah, but that, that was Tim's life. Yes. You know, Tim really turned that company on its ear as far as, as uh, products go and the way the products were made. And, and you, you can't forget that Apple is not just sending over you know, specs for products that uh, it wants to build. Yeah. Apple inventing new um, uh, manufacturing methods. They're hand setting the cores on their chips. 
they're I mean the stuff that they're doing in these factories is incredible. Yes. It's it's not just, hey, China, make this thing for us. It's they're inventing the stuff that invents the stuff. Exactly. That's exactly it. They invent the stuff that to invent the stuff. Yeah. And and it's it's kind of crazy when you think about that, that they're they're not just um trying to push out products. Excuse me. They're they're trying to to push out better products. Yes. I, I I really believe that. Yeah, and I do too. If you see Johnny Ives when he talks like an objectified or in interviews, he is as excited about the new machine he's made to cut or drill or do something as he is about the phone. Yeah, I know. It's so funny when you when you think about that. Um, I I I think it's it's pretty impressive when when Apple says, "Okay, we would like to use um, this this type of material." Because we think it lasts longer and we think it, you know, it's a, a great material to use, but we don't know how to cut it. Yeah. Well, let's, you know, invent this new way to cut <laughs> the material, uh, you know, and then we'll invent a new way to fit it into the factory. And, you know, that that takes balls to be able to to go in and say, you know what, we're going to spend. I don't know how much I'm, I'm just whatever talking. it takes going to spend an extra billion dollars to make sure that this is perfect yeah and it may be only one small thing wasn't there there was a story last year where johnny i've worked on on the 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 camera the eyesight camera yes. and the computers i think it was the computers and not the iphone where they they were looking for a new material uh to go over the lens to protect it and they worked for weeks on on these little tiny pixels yeah. uh, that would go over that, nobody even noticed. It's painting the back of the fence. Yeah, I mean, we noticed. That's, we, a, that's we noticed. a good question, Jim. So I always had this theory that the reason Apple is the way Apple is and Microsoft is the way Microsoft is now is that you know Tim, sorry, you know Steve Jobs sweated every detail. He spent years working on the iPad, and I don't think Steve Bomb particularly cares about the Surface or the phone or any. Any one product. I don't think he's there throwing it at somebody's head if it's not working right. <laughs> yeah, there's lots of great stories about <laughs> Steve, isn't there? <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, I don't think so either. And, you know, to be honest, I don't think that there are many CEOs like that. Yeah. Um, which is unfortunate because I, I think if. Now, I think most people know now that the iPad came before the yeah. iPhone. So Steve was working on the tablet, you know, back in, in the early 2000s. And they, they shelved the tablet and brought out the iPhone and started working on that for the next several years. Imagine another CEO that had this tablet technology. They probably would have, you know, boomed ahead. and They would and have shipped tablet PC. Exactly. Yeah. They would have shipped that. It wouldn't have been ready. It would have been complete crap because it, it wasn't done yet. So, you know, so I, I just I, I think that was part of the genius of it all. I guess my last question before the event is uh, Apple has done iPhones. They've done iPods. They've done iPads. Uh, the only thing really left, they've done the Retina Mac, but there's still iMacs. There's still Mac minis. There probably won't be Mac Pros because we've already heard maybe that's next year. But maybe other Matt Apple has talked about cars and trucks and you know their their cars way outsell their trucks do you think there's still room for Max in the spotlight do you think there's still are they are they still going to share the stage for many years to come um yeah I think so I don't see why not I mean you know I'm talking to you right now on a Mac me too you know I mean there there's still lots of room for for a Mac, but I, I think the, the PC market went down uh, and has continued to go, on, go down while the Mac keeps going up because Apple saw the, the writing on the wall, really, you know, that it wasn't cheap desktop PCs that, that everybody wanted. They, people wanted quality and they wanted portables. And, and I think that's why they continued to go up. I, I have a Mac Pro. 
right under the desk where I am now. And this is, you know, in my studio, this is where I, I do things. So with my music, so, you know, I'll always have one of those. Do they still get stage time though, or do they become increasingly press release stuff while iOS takes up more and more of the spotlight? Well, they continue to change them. Now, you know, they're not just Dell shipping out a, a new computer that you can do in a press release. They, they, they come up with a retina display yeah. and they come up with, uh, you know, uh, no, no optical drives and thin and, you know, they, they, they really, for the time being, there's still a place for them on stage uh, because people are still excited about them. Now, uh, somebody uh, said in the, the chat room there that mobile is, is Apple's main focus. Absolutely. No doubt. I mean, the iPhone is as big as, as Microsoft. Yes. Now. You know, I mean, that, that says a lot about where we as consumers feel Apple should be focusing their time. And they are focusing their time there. When, when one segment of, of Apple's company is as big as the entire business of Microsoft, then I, I think that, that, that pretty much says it all. But I still think for the time being that there, there is room for, um, for the Mac and Mac announcements on stage. Because people care about it. Yeah, absolutely. And it's as you said, it's growing. It's not going anywhere. And I think I forgot who said in the chat room, but they said people still need their trucks. And since we live in Canada, we know that to be absolutely true. Uh, Jim, where can we find out more about you? Oh, well, let me, uh, you can find me on Twitter at uh, Jay Dalrymple um, and at loopinsight.com. And you will be at the event next Wednesday. You'll Sorry, next Tuesday, you'll be covering it. I will be there, and I'll be doing um, a live update. Uh, and I do believe that now for the for the past few updates, um, I haven't, I don't have a, a, a scripts and things on my site. It's a very very plain site. Yep. And I do that on purpose because I think scripts really bog down the site and it makes it a bad reading experience and stuff like that. When when there's a lot of people on there, it really slows it down. So, but for the first time, I think we figured out a way to do uh, automatic updates. Nice. So you won't have to reload the page manually. It'll be an automatic update, and we should have pictures as well. Very nice. I look forward to it, sir. Yeah, awesome. it'll be a lot of fun. Jim, thank you very much for joining us. It's always the the one of the absolute best times that I have talking on this show. Excellent. Thank you, Renee. I really appreciate it. It's always fun. All right. And so we we will look forward to your report back from the event. Have a great weekend, Jim. Thanks a lot.